joining me here in the studio are uh, two people. We have Birgit Schwenk. She is the Director General for Climate Action at the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Welcome um, to our studio. Also, we have Hans-Peter Lankes. He is a visiting professor in practice in the London School of Economics. Thank you so much for being here as well. Um, I've already announced it. What is the Climate Club? It is a pretty young endeavor. It is um, uh, launched in December last year. What is it actually for those who have no idea? Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me and being able to explain a bit about this initiative that we've taken. That is an initiative that we have taken under the German G7 presidency, but it is actually not meant to be restricted to the G7. But it should be a broad initiative that involves all kinds of countries, emerging economies as well, developing countries as well. Um, the rationale behind this is that um, if you look at what the World Climate Council has told us, if we have to bring down emissions, by 43% by 2030 already, 60% by 2035, we have to look at all the sectors that cause greenhouse gas emissions. So um, that would also involve the industry sector. We focus a lot on the energy policy, but I think in the industry sector, we have still a lot of potential to bring down emissions. So um, with that in mind, we founded the Climate Club as a multilateral initiative a broad forum of diverse countries um, that want to focus on their policies to bring down emissions in the industry sector. Um, the Climate Club rests on three pillars. The first pillar um, is about exchanging, sharing best practices on such policies uh, with which we try to bring down uh, emissions. That can be a cap and trade system like the European emissions trading system, that can be carbon pricing, that can be also other instruments um, that uh, promote uh, industrial sectors where we have less emissions. Um, and we are going to exchange on these and look how they function together, whether we can make them more consistent, whether we can make them more comparable, and um, yeah, reap synergies of these. So that's the first pillar. Um, exchanging on such ambitious policies because it's supposed to be an ambitious club, obviously. Um, second pillar will be focusing on industry decarbonizations in the so-called hard-to-abate sectors. That is uh, mainly those sectors where it's difficult to find a method of, uh, of bringing down emissions. Um, this is especially true for um, such areas as green steel, green cement, the chemicals industry. And um, we are going to try and build lead markets for these products to make them more competitive and removing barriers um, of why such products, if we produce them green, um, which means mainly by using green hydrogen, um, yeah, that, that they believe markets that they become more competitive, give that a push and actually look at common standards and definitions because that is one of the barriers we have in these industries that the green products at the moment um, have no common shared definition and therefore no competitive advantage at the moment. And the third um, pillar will be focusing on partnerships between the countries in the club that's starting from different circumstances and we want to partner up and make sure that we use the existing instruments because it's going to build on existing instruments as you, um, as you mentioned to give them a more political push. Thank you so much for this breakdown so far and the pillars. Um, this is where I bring in Mr. Lankas. So there are other institutions and organizations already that have maybe similar goals. Um, why is it necessary then to have the Climate Club right now? No, you're quite right. Um, there are many organizations and fora that deal with the climate today, but collectively they are failing to deliver the results that we need. We're failing at this rate on the Paris Climate Goals. Um, what we need is engagement at the top so that we can break lockdowns. We need um, a critical mass of countries to participate that account for a, a large share of global emissions. We need countries that are ambitious and want to achieve these results. Uh, so those that are not ambitious should not be part of this and be able to slow it down. Yeah? Um, we need to be able uh, to, to trade across areas uh, so that we don't sit in, in, in fragments and get stuck in our negotiations. So we need to be able to trade across what uh, Mr. Schenk has said, uh, different areas of industrial policy, of, of, um, uh, of trade policy, 
Um, and uh, we need to have a focus on the climate. So, for instance, the G7, the G20 today, that also uh, you know, deals with climate uh, on occasion, is not focused on the climate. So if you get the Ukraine uh, uh, war, uh, the, these issues get sidelined. So we need those five elements, and the Climate Club is an opportunity to bring them together yeah, and to push uh, progress. Uh, this is also what uh, leads to the um, aspect of different countries who have different realities. Um, you've mentioned earlier that there's also developing countries, so-called developing countries and countries who are more wealthy. Now, how can the Climate Club chime in and uh, create an atmosphere or an infrastructure where all these um, different interests can be met and where people can discuss at eye level? That's exactly uh, the right uh, word, actually, eye level, um, because this is really what this initiative is about, that we want to get together um, with all countries that are serious and ambitious about the implementation of the Paris Agreement, also in the industry sector, um, and we want to get together together. Uh, at eye level and see how our different instruments work together and um, especially with countries that have also an in industrial base or economic interests in <coughs> the industry uh, sectors that we want to target. Um, yeah, we, we want to exchange on where are the different interests, where are the barriers, what is the understanding of different countries and uh, discuss these in an open and inclusive forum. Um, we're very lucky because we already have quite a bit of interest outside the G7 um, from many emerging economies as well and uh, I'm going to lead a task force that is going to um, construct uh, and flesh out the Climate Club further that uh, will develop um, a work program for this Climate Club and uh, I'm not the only uh, leader of this task force but I actually have a co-lead from uh, Chile and I'm very happy that Chile has agreed to, to co-chair this so we already have countries from outside the G7 and um, this is very important that we get get a uh, very diverse group of countries together, the major emitters as well in this sector. So, optimistic about that. <laughs> well, speaking of diverse countries, and then each country has different realities, you have different demographics, you have different natural resources, different focuses as far as econo economy. So, maybe the goal might be the same to reduce the emissions, but people have different ways of going on about it. So, Mr. Lankas, where, uh, how, can, uh, uh, how is it possible to overcome these contradictions uh, with the same goal, but maybe different ways of getting there? No, you're quite right. There are um, various motivations. And if we want to have a critical mass, as I mentioned before, we need lots of countries that will have somewhat different reasons for joining this club and that will have different uh, profiles of, in their policy mix. So we need to be able to bring that together. Um, uh, you have countries that uh, would be motivated by um, <coughs> ensuring that their policies don't lead to carbon leakage. So countries with, uh, with a, a strong carbon pricing regime like the European Union uh, is concerned that by applying that they actually create a competitive disadvantage with other countries and carbon gets created elsewhere instead of in their own countries. You have countries that are motivated by um, financial partnerships because they need to invest heavily into the climate transition but they do not have those funds or they have a very high cost of capital and they're looking to the uh, climate club as a a forum in which they may be able to, to uh, pursue uh, these objectives. And then you have countries like uh, Mr. Schwenk has said, uh, who, and, and actually many countries who would have common interests in finding um, uh, uh, pathways for their industries, uh, decarbonization pathways, and to standardize to, to align these pathways. So those are different motivations. Uh, and uh, we can bring them together in a climate club if we are inclusive and if we permit uh, various policy mixes um, around. What I think is important to, to uh, emphasize here is that there has to be a common motivation to uh, drive a positive narrative of sustainable growth. That this is not about a burden sharing exercise. You know, you cut carbon, uh, and then, you know, why should I cut carbon? You caused the problem. This is not what this is about. It is about finding common solutions for sustainable growth. That's so interesting, Ms. Schwenke. You've also mentioned that some countries have um, uh, uh, voiced their interest in joining or participating. How maybe could you maybe more elaborate on that process? How does that work? How um, how are these things then being figured out? Oh, okay, is this compatible? Or oh, this is something that we will be difficult. So maybe you could elaborate a little more on that process of countries uh, expressing their interest. Um, 
Yes, we have uh, a first decision that comes out of our G7 presidency um, on what the Climate Club will be. So we have a set of terms of reference, we call them, um, that are already uh, a broad um, basis on which we're going to work. But the next steps sort of the construction phase of our climate club, that is really to be done together with more countries. And um, as I said, we have Chile, we have other countries that have already declared they want to join, for instance, Indonesia, um, Argentina, Colombia. So th there are quite a number of countries now that are, um, that are interested. And all of these countries bring to the table their own experience. And we can build on this experience. And uh, as you've just said, uh, we uh, want to create a positive atmosphere to create lead markets, to make sure that, um, that products that are greener, that are more sustainable, um, and that have uh, also a possibility of creating sustainable jobs, um, that these lead markets are given a push. And so, yeah, positive agenda. We will uh, yeah, build on build on our experiences and I'm really excited and really curious on where this process takes us. Um, we are going to have a first meeting of uh, the members of the club, the old ones, um, the original ones, the G7, but also the new ones that are now joining, um, probably in the course of May. And uh, yeah, then I'm really curious of uh, which sectors we are going to focus maybe uh, on top of the ones that I've already mentioned. and. Uh, we will have, I think, a good impetus to work further on these issues in the industry sector. Ms. Lankas, as a trade economist, I would um, um, maybe can you give us insights of how do these conversations look like when different countries come in? Yes, there is a common goal of climate, but also it's about you know um, doing the best for each country. And every country has interests. So, how what are the main parameters or maybe discussion points that might come up in these type of negotiations when different countries come together for those goals? Well, you have, uh, of course, national policies that create tensions at the international level. So a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism like the European Union is installing it raises um, you know, concerns in countries that are exporting to the EU that feel they will be affected by that. Um, what we need there is a forum in which these issues can be discussed, negotiated. The WTO offers a forum, a climate club could agree to, um, to bring those issues to a discussion at the WTO to find common rules uh, and, and procedures for these issues. Um, it could also uh, be a forum to allow moving forward on certain industries that are particularly sensitive, like steel, like uh, cement or, or chemicals, uh, over a time frame of decarbonization that then makes it much easier to deal with the trade issues further down the road. So this is what uh, we were all mentioning uh, at the beginning. It's important to look at this climate club as uh, in, in all its facets. Uh, there are, uh, uh, <coughs> there's the trade side, but there's also the ability to work at the industry level. And if we combine these two, uh, we can uh, reduce the tensions. There's the finance side, and maybe my one final word on that. Looking at this from the global south, um, there is actually a proposal for, the, for a global climate alliance that is very compatible with the climate club idea that comes out of India. Um, the focus there is uh, very much on financial partnerships, which is one pillar of the climate club. Uh, so f to bring countries along that have a huge investment challenge, uh, in, but that contribute to the vast majority of the emissions reductions going forward, we need to find ways to address this, this finance uh, challenge. So looking across finance, trade, individual industries, uh, in that balance, there are ways of, uh, of, of creating a common, common ground uh, for all these countries. Considering all these aspects and having the Climate Club um, being in existence since December last year, where does the Climate Club stand right now? Yes, as I said, we are still in the construction phase. So um, we have uh, later groundwork um, and now we can start uh, the discussion on a proper work program and uh, have the first uh, meetings of this task force. And then we're looking at a more detailed work program um, by COP28 um, in the United Arab Emirates, COP28 um, in December. So this will then be 
hopefully, our full launch of this climate club. And uh, at the moment, we are conducting outreach, speaking with countries that are interested in joining and uh, yeah, getting, getting more of a feel for um, which areas of industry we are going to focus on and what interests are coming to the table. To close this deep dive, this is for both of you, what are some of the key priorities that people should know about what the Climate Club uh, will do and what are some of the maybe most promising things? We've talked about some of, so many of the challenges that people can look forward to, what the potential of the Climate Club actually could deliver. <laughs> um, I think it's going to give a, a push to industrial sectors that want to become green, greener and that will help all the countries. It's going to be an inclusive forum. We're really sitting down at eye level and looking at the different uh, best practices of how to get uh, greenhouse gas emissions down in these sectors. And I think this is really going to be a very high political push um, for that work together. For me, it's, uh, it's a process that has the potential to unblock uh, global climate action and to get us to be more ambitious and uh, to, to act uh, in, a, in a way that is commensurate with the, with the urgency of this challenge. It has that potential. It's very important uh, for me in that sort of looking at the G7 countries, that Germany that have initiated this, to make sure that the, the countries of the global south that will be carrying the largest share of the emissions reduction burden, that they have a, a, a very uh, prominent voice in shaping this climate club. They have to be part of forming it. Uh, they, they cannot just be invited to join something that is cooked up uh, in the north. They have to own this in order to make this effective. I want to thank you so much, uh, Birgit Schwenk from uh, the uh, German Federal Office for Climate Action and Foreign uh, and Economic Affairs, and also uh, Hans-Peter Lankes, um, visiting professor at the London School of Economics. This was really, really interesting. Thank you so very much. Thank you.